Howard County and Kokomo were at one time part of the Great Miami Reserve in Indiana that came about with a treaty around 1818 or so. But this was a time when the Miami were being pushed out of their traditional lands by the uh, European settlers that were moving in and they were being pushed into the less desirable areas of the state. And for many years, this particular part of the state was one of those less desirable areas. It was wet, swampy, buggy, malaria was common. It was not a pleasant place to live. And so the Miami were kind of squished down into this area of the state and finally pushed out altogether and sent to reservations elsewhere. But uh, the people who came in were tough people who were willing to make the kind of sacrifice to live in that environment, adventuresome people, and perhaps people who didn't have other opportunities. They did find ways to make a living here. It was an agricultural area. There was some trading. And over the years, they also found ways to uh, drain out the water a little bit better and make it a more habitable area. The story of Howard County is one of tenacity and iniquity, hope and heartache. It is the story of a land and a people forged from the swamps. The people had to learn to tame the land and then tame themselves. This is the story of a little known Indian chief who is said to either have been a great warrior or a drunken miscreant, of a mayor with a past that it was steeped in controversy. And of the men who would leave their homes and families only to return to a life that had been changed forever. It is the story of a man who never seemed to want to settle down, but when he did, it was in a swamp and he named it Kokomo. The area that is now Howard County has been occupied for 10,000 years. From native Indians to whites and blacks trying to make a new life for themselves. The area was drastically changed when French fur traders moved into the land from Canada. Jean-Baptiste de Richardville was a son of Joseph Drouet and Takuma, the sister of the Miami chief Pacana. When Pacana died, Richardville replaced him as chief. Francis LaFontaine was married to Richardville's daughter, Catherine. Along with Richardville, LaFontaine negotiated treaties with the American government that ceded Indian land to the whites. In 1838, they sold 177,000 acres for $335,680. Another treaty was negotiated in which the Miami ceded their remaining land, the Big Miami Reserve, for $550,000 and land for their chiefs. The treaty called for the removal of the Miami Indians east of the Mississippi. Many remained to live on the property of Richardville and LaFontaine. In January of 1844, an act was passed to organize the county of Richardville. The county commissioners had chosen the land south of the Wildcat for the seat of their new county. The landowner, David Foster, instead offered to donate 40 acres on the north side of the Wildcat. The new site was located in the middle of a swamp where wildcats and snakes roamed freely. A breeding ground for mosquitoes where malaria was rampant. Lots were 66 by 132 feet and sold for about $30. David Foster was known to be a fair bargainer, often coming out on top in his dealings despite having a speech impediment. Foster was born in 1808 in Virginia. 
his family frequently moved. First to Kentucky, where he received minimal education, and then to Indiana, where he learned the cabinet maker's trade. Much like his family, Foster couldn't seem to settle in one place for too long. He moved to Mooresville, where he met and married Elizabeth Matilda Grant in 1832. The newly married couple moved to Burlington, where Foster traded with the Indians. In 1842, Foster moved his family to the land where Kokomo would be founded. A legend has it that Foster's wagon, full of liquor, was bogged down in the swamp, and Francis LaFontaine took notice. They made a trade. The truth is less colorful. Foster purchased the land from Allen Hamilton for $4,000, who had purchased it from Francis LaFontaine for $2,000. In 1844, Foster donated land for the county seat, along with an agreement that he would build a courthouse. He never built the courthouse, but was allowed to let the job out to Rufus L. Bowers. The courthouse was built for $28. That courthouse stood in the city square until a new two-story courthouse was built in 1870 for $110,000. The French pronunciation of the name Richardville proved difficult for the locals. Oftentimes they called it Richerville or Rucheville. The name was changed in dedication to Tillman Howard, a congressman in 1847. By all accounts, most people say that David Foster named the town Kokomo as a way to get back at some of the local politicians who had renamed um, Richardville County, which is what Howard County was originally called for Jean-Baptiste Richardville. They renamed it Howard County for a local politician by the name of T.A. Howard, which is interesting because we're, we're called Howard County, but yet the man who the county is named for never stepped foot in Howard County at all in his life, um, which I think is kind of interesting. The city of Kokomo, Indiana was incorporated in 1855. The new settlers in the area had to clear away a dense forest and drain the swampland that kept them plagued with disease. They had to battle snakes and wildcats. The land was lawless. When asked why the town was named Kokomo, David Faust replied, Kokomo is the orneriest town I ever knew, so I named it after the orneriest old Indian I ever knew. Little details are known about the one called Chief Kokomo. His story is one with two sides. It is said that he was a great warrior or that he was an alcoholic. Some say he never existed and others tell stories of his nature. His true story is most likely lost to history. The uh, story of David Foster talking about Chief Kokomo is the orneriest only old Indian that, that he, he knew is, um, pretty close to being local legend. It goes back a lot of years. Foster uh, said it later in life, if indeed he actually said it. And uh, he probably didn't have much actual content with uh, contact with Chief Kokomo himself. Their lives didn't intersect in, in ways the legend would have it. Uh, that doesn't mean that there was no contact, but it was probably limited. So there's, you know, there, it's a little bit of a local legend, but it's a fascinating story. And it does perhaps characterize what Kokomo uh, is now, and certainly was at the time, because at the time that he said it, um, or is said to have said it, uh, Kokomo was a bit of an ornery town. Uh, we had had our ups and downs over the years, but in the early years, this was a frontier of sorts and it attracted frontier people. There was lawlessness, it was a rough life. And it took ordinary people to, to live in that town and make a life out of it. And he was certainly one of them, Foster himself. It wasn't until the winter of 1853 when the first trains arrived to Kokomo 
that life in the infant city began to change. In 1852, the population numbered in the 100s. By 1860, the population was 1,040. The first railroad um, was installed in Kokomo in, in the early 1850s, and it became the beginnings of the infrastructure. Early on, Kokomo was an agricultural settlement. The farmers used almost all of their crops for their own livelihood. The first railroad helped to develop the economy, allowing farmers to market their crops elsewhere. This, in turn, helped the town grow, bringing people that were looking to cultivate a new life for themselves. Kokomo as a town was a town of people who were not just innovators and entrepreneurs, but these were people who may not have had, they might not have come from the, the best side of the tracks. These were people who did not have opportunities in other areas of the country, and so they came to Kokomo as a, as a refuge. As the town grew in size, so did the crime. The first lynching in Kokomo's history happened in June of 1863. Uh, it happened, the, the lynching itself happened on the 9th. The crime that perpetrated it happened on the 7th. Uh, two men rode into town. One was named John Thrall. The other man's name is lost to history. But they were on stolen horses. Uh, Kokomo had been notified that men were on stolen horses. There were descriptions of the horses that were put out. The two men arrived at the stable of John and Nelson Cooper. Nelson and the sheriff's deputy were on the lookout for the men. When they arrived, Nelson Cooper grabbed the bridle of one of the horses. One of the men pulled out his revolver and shot Cooper, killing him. He aimed at the deputy but missed and hit a bystander, Reverend John Lowe Sr., who would die from his wounds later. The two men fled on the horses. Henry Stewart, a soldier in the army, was on the street at the time. He pulled his revolver and shot one of the men in the hip. The man fell from his horse and was captured. It is not truly known what happened to his accomplice. The assailant was seized from jail and a makeshift gallow was erected. Thrall was defiant to the end. Uh, he was standing on a couple of boxes. He noticed that the noose didn't fit around his neck very well. So he adjusted it and all the while he's adjusting it around his neck, he's taunting the crowd. Uh, he's, he's not remorseful at all for the two killings that he did. And while he's still ranting against the crowd, somebody kicked the boxes out from under him. Another instance of mob mentality and murderous revenge took place in May of 1881. The three-year-old daughter of a Mr. Pritchard was taken from her crib and an outrage was attempted upon her. Richard Long had been seen in the vicinity and his conduct aroused suspicion that he was the perpetrator. He was arrested and jailed. A crowd gathered at the jail. Other criminal allegations were brought against Mr. Long. These allegations only made his cause look more bleak. Regardless of his guilt or innocence, on April 3rd, a masked mob cut the lock off of the jail door. They took their prisoner to a bridge and strung him up. The mob formed around him and only two people were let in, Judge Vail, who tried to talk the crowd down, and a reverend who talked to Richard Long. The reverend asked Richard Long if he had any last requests, and uh, as the crowd was around him yelling at him and for his death, he said, yes, I'd like to sing a song called Keep My Grave Green. When I am dead and gone from you, darling, when I am laid away in my grave, when my spirit is gone to heaven above, to whom my soul will save, 
Oh, the day will come to you, darling, when no more on earth I'll be seen. There is one little wish, darling, grant me. You see that my grave is kept green. A contemporary journalist at the time from Ohio called Kokomo a Sodom and Gomorrah and, and, and referred to its citizens as Kokomokes, as a sort of term of, of neg a negative, had a negative connotation to it. And so the town was filled with people who were bootleggers and, and bank robbers and th horse thieves and, and got sort of that reputation. And in many ways that was true. And I would say the story that probably exemplifies that type of period was the story of Dr. Henry Cole. Henry C. Cole was a gifted physician and an ex-surgeon in the Union Army. He had a reputation for violence. In 1866, he suspected his wife of having an affair with a gentleman by the name of Allen. Cole confronted Allen outside of the post office and shot and killed the man. He was acquitted on a plea of insanity. This was a man who came to Kokomo uh, and didn't always have the, the, the most particularly sterling reputation. Um, he was known for doing illegal abortions in Kokomo. In fact, one of the young women on, on, on which he performed the, um, the uh, procedure ended up going missing. He was never charged with a crime, but this girl ended up disappearing and no one had seen of her since. Uh, and he was known to be a very, a very tempestuous man, a very full of rancor and, and, and sort of uh, volatility. In 1881, Cole ran for mayor of Kokomo. He won a hard-fought campaign in which he made enemies and promised to clean up the town. In September of 1881, the sheriff of Kokomo claimed that he had been informed that Mr. Cole was planning to rob the spring mill. The sheriff and a posse confronted Cole at the mill. The sheriff claimed that Cole had two revolvers and was trying to escape. The posse fired on Cole. A shotgun blast from Deputy George Bennett killed Mayor Henry Cole after less than a year in office. Kokomo, however, was not just a land for criminals. The people of Kokomo were talented actors, writers, and musicians. Byron Reed was called a gypsy, poet, and philosopher. He was the first band leader in Kokomo and the city's first photographer. When he believed he had a terminal illness, Reed shot and killed himself. Byron was friends with a man named Peter Hersleb. Hertzleb was a mysterious man. He was kind, generous, and a recluse who lived on an orchard. At the request of a group of women, including Jane Turner, Peter Hersleb donated land and money to help create a children's orphanage. Howard County was the first in Indiana to take orphans out of an institution and give them a home to live in. At the request of Byron Reed, his daughter June played the violin for Peter Herslip. Upon hearing June play, Peter Herslep began to break down his defenses and open up about his past. He had fled his fiancée in Denmark because of political strife. He was from a wealthy family and was once a talented musician. He had lost his gift due to a knife wound across his wrist. He longed for his beloved, always carrying her picture in a locket close to his heart. He died alone in Philadelphia. His generosity allowed the less fortunate in Kokomo 
to have a chance at life. As long as we've had enslaved Africans in the United States, we've had people who've wanted to find their freedom. These enslaved Africans would move north, predominantly north, but not always. And in Indiana, we like to think north because then that means there's a possibility they came through Indiana and we may have had an impact on their lives. They would come into the southern part of the state, usually the free black communities, and find a place to stay, some, some rest, some food, and then start a, a course of action to move north. Most enslaved Africans, when they left the plantation, didn't have a plan. Something happened, whether it was one too many beatings, um, they were find out that they were going to be sold to another plantation, but something happened that motivated them to leave the plantation. When they came to these free black communities in the southern part of Indiana, they would find help. And then the free black community might know about it, an organization that we today call the Underground Railroad, which was just people helping people find freedom. Howard County like the rest of the nation, was divided. There were abolitionists and pro-slavery advocates. In the western part of the county, black settlements formed. These settlements, along with people in Rucheville and New London, helped escaped slaves find their way to freedom. The free blacks of the county were blacksmiths, politicians, baseball players, and more. One of the black youths that helped on the railroad was Richard Bassett. He would go on to become a congressman for Howard County. I find it interesting and unique in that the Rucheville area and the New London area of the oral traditions and that the teenage, people, the teenage children whose parents participated knew what was going on and participated alongside of them. And sometimes we find this, but very rarely. Usually um, parents kept this from their children to keep them both safe and innocent from the things that were happening in and around them. And so to have this type of of history and this type of resource. And so in the 19 teens, these adult children were then talking about what their parents did is rare and it's a special treasure for Kokomo. One afternoon there came a mulatto boy. He was a fugitive from Kentucky. He was almost exhausted with travel and hunger and his feet were worn sore. Mother fed him and gave him water to bathe his feet. Also gave him a place to sleep for he was in much need of rest. Just a little before night, Three strangers rode into the little town and began to make rapid inquiry if anyone had any mules. It soon leaked out they were after the mulatto boy. Father went out to the barn and saddled a spirited gray mare, then put me on the back with the Negro boy on behind me. We rode out of Rucheville at breakneck speed. A pack of hounds set in, making a terrible noise after some animal. If there was ever a scared Negro boy, it was the one on the horse with me. He thought the hounds were after him. James Cooper
In 1861, the Civil War began at the Battle of Fort Sumter. The residents of Howard County answered the call to serve their nation. They came from all walks of life. Farmers, lawyers, doctors, and shopkeepers all fought side by side. I am in the shade under a tree on the side of a mountain above a rippling brook, overlooking the town in sight of 3,000 troops. My health is good, and so is the health of the boys. We are all in fine spirits. Were it not for being absent from you and the children, I should be very happy. The life is an active and exciting one, and you know with what energy I prosecute anything of that kind. Captain T.J. Harrison Thomas Joshua Harrison came to Kokomo to be a teacher, but instead became a lawyer. After the Battle of Fort Sumter, he rounded up 200 men to enlist for three months. They were Company D in the 6th Indiana Infantry Regiment. Their nickname was the Howard Rifles. He would re-enlist for three more years, commanding the 39th Indiana Infantry at the Battle of Shiloh. They were turned into the 8th Indiana Cavalry and were involved with Rousseau's raid in 1864. Harrison was given command of the brigade after the raid and marched with General William Tecumseh Sherman on his way to Atlanta. After the Civil War, uh, after he had mustered out in late 18, early 1865, he was brevet promoted, honorary promoted, to general to become Howard County's highest ranking Civil War veteran. After the Civil War, he moved to Tennessee. He tried his hand at business, had a flour mill, uh, but he was appointed as sheriff of, or U.S. Marshal of Central Tennessee by Ulysses Grant. Uh, and served in that post for several years before he died in his 40s. He was brought back to Kokomo for burial at uh, Crown Point Cemetery in the, family, the Harrison family plot. Thomas Kirkpatrick came to Howard County in 1843 as a farmer. He served as sheriff in 1852 and 53. When the call to serve came, he signed up. Kirkpatrick served as a captain and commander of E Company in the 13th Indiana Infantry Regiment. He was thought to be dead during the Battle of Cold Harbor, and his wife was informed as such. However, he was not dead. He was just in the middle of the troops where no one could get to him until after the fighting had died down. Uh, he was found, he was nursed back to health, and then after his stint in the Union Army, during the Civil War, he comes home, and according to family history, his wife just can't take it. She denies his existence, she shuts him out, and until the day she died, he slept in the barn. Whenever they went any place, she'd ride in the carriage, he'd ride on a horse behind, but because at that time, divorce just didn't happen in the United States. Uh, but he stayed estranged from his wife until she died. 1,100 men from Howard County fought in the Civil War. 221 died. Future President Benjamin Harrison spoke at the dedication ceremony at Crown Point Cemetery. There are things finer than wheat and corn and cotton. The high things are spiritual things, things of the heart and mind, devotion unlimited. We remember the devotion of the dead. Where are they? Not here. Not with the family circle surrounded by friends and hearing their last farewells, but they died amid the shock of battle, the clang of musket, and the charge of squadron. Senator Benjamin Harrison. The story of Kokomo is filled with colorful characters from all walks of life. Wayward souls, interesting and thought-provoking men and women. It is filled with criminals, the law-abiding, the artistic, and the innovative. 
So what does it say about um, Kokomo's early wild history? What does it say about um, Kokomo now? Well, I would say this, uh, and David Foster decided and has gone on record as saying that Kokomo is the orneriest town I know, and so I named it after the orneriest person I know. And I think that there's a part of that still in, in our community. Not so much the, the, the more illegal aspects of what they would do necessarily, but certainly the gumption, I think, is part of, a part of Kokomo's spirit. We are a community that perseveres. And the people who lived in this community were people that persevered as well. They fought back from you know, neighboring invaders, they fought back from disease, they fought back from, from violence, they fought back from all kinds of, of problems that could have set them back. And I think it's really important to tell that story because it does speak volumes about Kokomo today. The community here decides in, in, in themselves this, uh, that it's important for them to persevere, to continue, to fight, to innovate, to appreciate the, the past and to sort of go forward in the future with that same sort of pioneering spirit. And I think that's the story um, that's good about Kokomo. So if that means we're a little ordinary, I, I guess, then, then, then that's a good thing. The little town that David Foster had established grew and expanded through difficult times because of the tenacity of the residents, because they had the audacity to try. This characteristic quality of Kokomo would continue with new inventions and new discoveries.